Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us please stand and affirm the proclamation of the faith of our heart, the promise that relates to the door of our hope. Let the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this once again privilege to be in the place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. And so allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted to heights higher than us and to break all burden and sin that binds us. May in this service be cursed as before all the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depression, destruction, selfishness, ignorance. All of this let it depart from the tents of your holy people and stand, Lord, on the place of your rest, you in the ark of your might, and may your saints be clothed in your salvation and may they rejoice before your countenance. Give us more from your Spirit, fill us with your Holy Spirit, Allow us to find your holy countenance. We thank you that this service is presented by Apostolate Gaudi into your divine hands, and we ask you to continue to lead it with your high and uplifted hand, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May you be blessed. Please be seated. Peace to you, the beloved Church of God. That is wonderful in the eyes of God. I will read the place of Holy Scripture, Matthew chapter 5, verses 45 and 48. That you may be the sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And then verse 48, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Called to perfection. For us as members of the body of Christ, upon our collaboration with the truth of the Word and the power of the Holy Spirit, to formulate ourselves into the image of perfection that is inherent to our Heavenly Father, we will look at today the allegory, or will remember it, that is presented to us in the book of Songs of Solomon, and of course that has been interpreted by the Holy Spirit through our pastor and brother Arkady. You can find it and listen to this sermon on our church website, this is September 4th, 2016. I want to note right away that the book of Songs of Solomon is a completely sealed and closed book, just like the whole Bible, which few people even tries to, uh, few try to even talk about it among the carnal leaders because for them it is inaccessible and um Non, not understandable. It is a mystery. And even if someone does have the audacity, what's interesting is that when they do talk about it, they distort it, they mock it, and they view it in regard to a fleshly thinking. It is frightening what Babylon produces, what kind of food they produce how they distort the truth of the word. And you know what astonishes me is that this food, this wicked, abominable food, is what the majority of Christians today feed feed from. You can look at the member at the numbers of people who they listen to and what they listen to, what kind of leaders. And in Revelation, we know it's written that Babylon had given to drink all the peoples. And God has already spoken a decree over this harlot. And what is interesting is that there is a verdict to those leaders 
that represent Babylon and those that follow these leaders. In Revelation, it is written that if anyone distorts the word of this book, takes away from it, or adds on to it, to them, God will God will take away their partaking to the book of life and all that is written in this book. And God has already written a verdict to Babylon, and He has signed it with His name. Amen. And this is not just to those leaders who distort it, distort the word, who are not being sent, try to speak that which that their intellect applies to it or their own understandings. Those that listen and those that speak it will receive will receive uh, God's retribution for it. We know in Scripture it is written that all of Scripture is inspired by God, and no prophecy can be understood by oneself because prophecy was never spoken according to the will of man, but it was spoken by saints, by people of God who were led by the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God that God has sent to us such great mercy in the face of His Messenger who today uncovers this prophetic word and interprets it for us. And Apostle Peter says, You do well that you turn to him as to the lamp shining in the dark place until the morning star arises in the hearts of yours. So until you grow, until we together grow, because we have heard this truth, until we grow the truth, the truth that we hear of today in the birth of Methuselah about how to banish death and decay out of our bodies. Let's turn to one of the allegories that is taken from Songs of Solomon, and we today will look at the sign. And so the sign and the dignity of the most beautiful of women, differing her from other virgins, is her beloved turning to her so that she awakens and stands from her sleep and comes out to meet him. This is spoken to the church in the format of a command so that the church rises up, awakens, and comes out to meet the Lord. This is not a command to the world because this holy book was not written for the world. And what is interesting is that this is not all who call today themselves believers or who attribute the name of a Christian to themselves without being so, having an outward appearance of godliness. Songs of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 10 through 14, we are going to see right now. My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth her green figs. And the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Practically, this allegory uh, is compared to the parable of Christ about the ten virgins who represent the kingdom of heaven, especially with the words, if you know this parable really well, that in the middle of the night there was a cry, come out to meet your groom. And then it's written that all the virgins rose and they fixed their lamps. This is the same meaning and this is the same purpose that is contained in this allegory that we are studying in the following phrase, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. 
My dove in a cleft of the rock in the secret places of the cliff. Let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. This event is called to happen in the middle of the night, the image of which is is the uh, time in which Christianity is at most in contention with God. Again, not the world, the world which was always laying corrupt in its lust. I always I understood that we should not say the phrase, looking at this world, we say, what is happening in this world? Where is the world going? How do we leave our children to go out into this world? But we're not called to look at the world. The world always headed toward hell from the very moment when Cain had turned away from God, from the face of God, and when he had built his city on in the east. Pastor made a note here that this event is called to happen in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night there was a cry. Middle of the night, this is again the full uh, full contention, the full calamity within the religious structure, within religious Christianity, which they perhaps don't even see. And although this allegory we see it evident also in the parable of Christ about the ten virgin that represents the image of the kingdom of heaven. It uncovers certain details that are tied with our state that will precede rapture, but which lack in the parable of the ten virgins. For example, in the parable of the ten virgins, it is said that all the ten virgins fell asleep, but in the middle of the night there was a cry. The groom is coming, come out to meet him. And then they all rose and fixed their lamps, and they went out. And in this allegory that we are studying, we see the nature itself of sleep in which all ten virgins were immersed, represent the image of the kingdom of heaven. So the parable of ten virgins doesn't talk about what was happening during the sleep. It just talked about how they, slept, how they uh, went to sleep and slept. It doesn't talk about what happened during this, during this night, during this sleep. But here in this allegory, we see with great detail the nature of this slumber, which Pastor showed in specific seven living signs. Today, of course, the church, in the image of its chosen remnant, in the image of the beloved, it dwells in the death of the Lord Jesus. It is found in that very blissful sleep in which, figuratively, the ten virgins were found. But here she is found in the cleft of the rock in the secret places of the cliff. We know this image very well about why she is found there. The cleft of the rock in the secret places of the cliff where the Beloved was is an image of the death of the Lord Jesus in which dwells God's chosen nation in the face of the Beloved. And today the Lord, through His preached word, tells us to rise and to come away. This is a very, um, this is a command of God, which today sounds through His messenger. This is God turning to His church, to His beloved. And you know, it brings, it's so stunning because you see that this is the same word, the same call which we today hear today, which the Holy Spirit has already uncovered and shown that the right He has given us to set aside our former way of life, to renew our thinking through the very truth that we have received into our heart and have become to ponder upon it and to clothe our body into the new man so that we can become perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, so that we can receive our earth, our body as a belonging, that we can adopt our body. This phrase, Arise, my beloved, my dear one, my love, my fair one, and come away, talks about how the beloved calls her out from the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, which she carried in her body, into the state of resurrection of the Lord Jesus, so that she can become a carrier of the life of Jesus in her body. 
Not all today carry the death of the Lord Jesus in their body. They may say, many will, may say up until a certain time, we also didn't understand what it means to carry the death of the Lord Jesus in our body. For us, this was like the letter, like a slogan, like some kind of law. We didn't understand. We have to be very well enlightened in this. And of course, we have been enlightened about what kind of death we are referring to, how to carry it. We had to be instructed in this. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, Apostle Paul writes, Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So the life of God is meant to be uncovered in the bodies of saints under the condition that they carry this death and that they understand how to carry it. So before Christ raptures His church upon the sound of the last trumpet, So before the sound of the last trumpet, we see, as Pastor has said, that God is going to rapture only those, only those saints who here on the earth will be clothed in His resurrection. So God will rapture only those who here will receive this resurrection. Let's read. The resurrection and the body of the Lord Jesus will produce will produce great awe among the religious world and the wicked who at one time had tried to sway away these people. But they, according to the direction of God, swayed away only the lawless. And before we see these signs today, we need to just even remember again what it means for the church as the chosen remnant of God, what it means to rise up and to come out or to come away. You know, this sermon we listened to here, this was 2016. This was upon this place. Today, when I listen to it, I feel the same trembling, even a greater trembling. This is not a worry. This is a festive, a festive trembling. We know that God is already doing something great, wonderful, and glorious. And something soon is going to occur. And we today are found in a glorious anticipation. And I want to say that to rise up and to come away can only be done by the one who has an ear to hear. And Revelation, it's written, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Pastor oftentimes remind us, almost in every sermon, that to hear is possible only under one condition. If we are going to be uh, built into a tower, tower that is a watchtower, we are going to be where we are going to be watchmen. And not only we will be watchmen, but we are going to have the Holy Spirit with whom we will lead this dialogue where we're going to ask Him and He is going to respond to us. As we say, it's necessary for us to ask the watchman also, the head watchman, how much time is left in the night. And as Pastor says, we need to build ourselves into a temple so that all of these golden attributes are present there. These are all images, but the truth remains unchanged. And I want to say, let's first look at one initial phrase. Before we look at the sign, the sign that is necessary for us to see, We need to look at certain phrases that are going to precede this living sign. And the initial phrase, which is very important, My beloved spoke and said to me, this is a very important phrase. It tells us that the chosen remnant of God is going to listen, to hear the voice of their beloved 
because he has built himself into a watchtower and he has the Holy Spirit who is going to lead a dialogue with him through the person that has been appointed by God. He will hear the voice of his beloved in his heart and is going to distinguish this voice from other voices when he is going to listen to and follow the voice of the person whom God has sent before him. So to hear, to answer, and to follow the voice of the person whom God has placed over us. This is possible under one condition, when we build ourselves through instruction in faith into a tower, a tower on which we can be vigilant. Let's read in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The prophet Habakkuk had built himself into this tower. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. Remember, Pastor had noted here that this the one who reads is God. That's why it's necessary to write this with a capital letter. The reader, he who reads it, in capital for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the time it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Why did God turn to God's chosen remnant? Why did God turn specifically to the church, having called her his beloved? The reason why God turned to His chosen people so that they may rise and come out to meet Him is found in the mutual love of God and man. We know that this is not just written, For God so loved the world, it says, For God so so loved, so loved, this word loved, we know it specifically, For God so loved, this world that whoever believes in him so god has loved every believer in this world i want to highlight for god so loved where it talks about how because god has loved this means that a person has first loved him there is this mutual bond just like we say he has he has made collaborated co-crucified when we talk about these words here we have this kind of collaboration, this mutual tie. And God has loved, and that's why a pastor highlights that God has loved every believer in this world, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish. If you, if we look at this, we see that who, he who believes is he who listens to the preached word, accepts the preached word and submits to it this is not just a person who hears but he has to also accept this word and submit to this word therefore it turns out that when god began to speak these words he turns only to the beloved that's why when a pastor begins service or he turns to the church he says my beloved church of zion beloved church understanding that this church these hearts have also loved god they want to listen and they want to submit and obey in the phrase my beloved the holy spirit has shown how his people is called to love god and what his people must do so that god could love them or what god has loved his people for and how he has loved his people today uh, many people dishonor god when they say the foolish phrase as we know that God loves everyone. This is truly a foolish phrase for the very reason that God doesn't love everyone. God doesn't love sinners. God doesn't love the wicked. God doesn't love those who don't love Him. God doesn't love those who don't love His law. God loves and has loved only His own, His church, for her. When it is said that God loved those who have loved Him and who have known Him, and God then gives a guarantee to a person. Let's read Psalms 91 and what God says to man who has loved him. God says, Because he has set, because he, man, has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him, I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He should call upon me and I will answer him. 
I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Before this sermon, one week before, this was 28th of August, this sermon that we are reading right now, this is September 4th, 2016. One week before this sermon, it was a Sunday and it was the 28th of August, and Pastor had dedicated almost the whole service to showing through many places of Scripture who God has loved and who God has hated. Because we know that the love of God is defined by how? By the fulfillment of our uh, fulfillment of His commandments. And violation of His commandments talk of hatred toward God. If a person doesn't want to heed to the commandments of the Lord through the lips of the messengers of God, then God rejects such a person. God says, Oh, if you would have heeded my commandments, but a person doesn't want to heed, and then God rejects. But those who do listen, He begins to bless them, and He says, I will deliver you, I will bless you, I will protect you. But with regard to love toward God, this is not the seed that testifies of this, but the fruit. The fruit will testify of our love for God. Let's look at another phrase that is going to precede these seven signs, and then we will look at these seven signs. Because first, as Pastor said, we must see that the Beloved has spoken to me. The fact that we can hear ourselves, uh, we hear the Word of God. Why did God turn to the Beloved? Because she also has loved Him. And the next word, my love, my fair one, the Holy Spirit with these words show the difference between the dedication of His chosen one from uh, the dedication of her friends. Because my love, my fair one, isn't just beautiful, pleasant, when we have this in our understanding, but instead let's look at how this on one hand is the dedication of His remnant that differs from the dedication of her friends. And God boasts of this, His love, His fair one, before her friends and before Satan. Just like with Job, God boasted of him. Job didn't see right away, but God had viewed him as His love, His fair one. He later had understood that when His days on the earth had ended and He had, or rather His days of wander, He had seen this. And my love, my fair one, is the affirmation of her royal dignity that is produced through the studying, through trials, and weighing her on the scales of divine justice. This will be her reward. How does God view this word in, uh, in Hebrew? His love, His fair one. This means beautiful, pleasant, finding favor in the eyes of God, bringing comfort to God's heart, bringing joy to God's heart, partaking to the royal heritage, the affirmation of a royal dignity, the dignity which God boasts of, and is one that is tested and weighed on the scales of justice. What is interesting is that she doesn't testify of herself that she is his, um, his love and his fair one. It is God who himself calls his Zion, his fair one, his beloved city, his fair one. And David had said about this city, the fair city, the mountain of Zion, joy of the earth. Talking about Benjamin, if you remember, this was the twelfth son, the patriarch Benjamin. God said these, the following words, Beloved by God dwells in him safely. And he is found between the shoulders, meaning that God gave this blessing and this fate to everyone who would accept it in themselves. This is not we that say this about ourselves or give this appraisal. It's not Moses that gave himself the appraisal that he was wonderful in the eyes of God. Moses was wonderful, but it was God that gave him this appraisal. God gave the following appraisal to David as well. Remember when Abraham and Sarah 
when they redirected to Egypt and Abraham had said to Sarah the following words, he said, I know that you are a woman that is beautiful and when the Egyptians will see you, they are going to kill me, but they are going to keep you alive. This was not Sarah that testified of herself. What I want to say is, we must not appraise ourselves. Let God appraise us. Take a look at how Apostle Paul had said of himself. He knew right, he knew fully well that he, in the eyes of God, has that perfection and that weight, but he never appraised himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself. Again, he knew that he was wonderful, but he says, Yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the hidden things from darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts then each one's praise will come from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes. They may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. And for us to understand the time in which the sound of the trumpet of God will sound in the subject of the word, Behold, the groom is coming, come out to meet him. We need to distinguish and differ the sign of the times because this cry is not going to be uh, usual, like as usual. So the level at which we understand today that is going to be expressed within the signs in the same level we will be able to hear it. How we understand. The word to understand is not just to understand in us. What our pastor has explained, it is... There is the level of pondering and level of of reasoning. And I right now begin to under, understand this especially. And these signs that yield the cry in the middle of the night will be statutes, the fulfillment of which will make us prepared to the coming of the Lord for His bride. So it makes our ears acceptable to this. But if we don't understand these signs, if we don't formulate ourselves into these signs, we won't be able to hear this. We won't know and understand this time of the coming of the Lord for His bride. And in this allegory, we find seven signs that are going to occur in three invisible uh, dimensions of the Spirit. These are the heights of the heavens in the sanctuary in the humble and contrite spirit of a person. All right, let us look at these seven living signs, and it is very important for us to see them. These are signs where we are going to see the first sign. For lo, the winter is past. Second, the rain is over and gone. Third, the flowers appear on the earth. Fourth, the time of singing has come. Fifth, the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Sixth sign, the fig tree puts forth her green figs. And seventh, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. And so the first sign, for lo, the winter is past. So we are going to see these signs in ourselves, and believe me, you will see all of them. These signs are here. Pastor posed two questions, and in the context, we will see the answer. What does winter mean in its three dimensions of the Spirit, and the instructions of what statute is it necessary for us to fulfill to receive the opportunity to hear in these three dimensions the cry in the night, and to be ready to the coming of the Lord. Of course, in order for us to understand the meaning that happens or to understand that the winter uh, has passed, let's read Genesis chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. For us, this place of scripture was presented to us. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, 
winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. I think you remember that here we see a certain time lacking. This is a spring and autumn. There's a reason for this. The sworn vow that the Lord had sworn upon making a covenant with man and with the whole earth, meaning with our body, with our essence, and we know with the earth, but right now we're talking with about ourselves, was comprised of the fact that sowing and harvest as the state of cold and heat occurs during the time of winter and summer. And this sowing and harvest is the image of day and night, which throughout all days of the earth will not cease. And so the definition of winter, cold, and night in the dimension of the spirit, again, not in the dimension of time, the dimension of the spirit, is a time of sowing. So winter, cold, and night is the time for sowing. The time of summer, heat, and day is the time of harvest. The time of harvest is the time for retribution for the decision we made expressed in gathering fruit grown in our heart out of that seed which we had sown during the cold of the winter. Cold or winter is the image of the death of the Lord Jesus in which we sow when we die to our nation, to the house of our Father, and to our soul and its inclinations towards leadership in our essence. Revelation chapter 3 verses 15 and 16. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So that because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. For us, we understand very well what it means to be cold. This means to be dead to sin. And to be hot means to be alive to God. And so in order to receive the opportunity to hear this cry in the night that, behold, the winter has passed, we need to present ourselves into it as a sacrifice to God in order to become for Him a pleasing sacrifice. And we've come to the following conclusion. Let's look at how the winter is when we sow ourselves in the death of the Lord Jesus. It is given to us as an opportunity to sow ourselves. A person that has not sown himself during the time of sowing and the death of the Lord Jesus, meaning during the winter, cannot during the harvest or during the summer to gather the fruit of resurrection, because of which he cannot hear the voice in the night, Arise, my beloved, my fair one, come out. And behold, when summer passes in which the time of harvest will cease, they all of a sudden will realize that they have no healing. Based on what we have read, we have a question that arises. Well, then how do we place ourselves as a sacrifice to God? And how do we sow ourselves in the death of the Lord Jesus so that we can see that, that the winter has passed in our essence? And what it means that the winter has passed? We have read about this, and let's read again. To receive the opportunity to hear the sound in the night that winter has passed, we need to present ourselves as a sacrifice to God to become a pleasing aroma to Him. How do we place ourselves or present ourselves as a sacrifice? We know the answer. When we die to our nation, so to our nationality, to this world and the subject of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, when we die to the house of our Father, to the vain life of our forefathers, and to all of our carnal desires, this can be done only in the winter. Winter is the image of death. When we sow ourselves and die to reigning sin in us. And we hear this, we heard this, and we have such a state. But today we also heard something else. We heard that winter has passed. You'll ask, well, do we no longer need to die? Why did we hear this sign? Behold, winter is past, because the Lord has uncovered for us the great promise about the adoption of our bodies, about the resurrection of Christ, about the building up of this imperishable body, of this power of life. And when we had heard this, in that very moment, the Lord said, in our essence, and we have heard this cry, winter has passed. 
This doesn't mean that we don't need to die in death. The death of the Lord Jesus remains because God is going to lead us out of his death and into resurrection. Only those that understood this cry, this cry in the night that the winter has passed. And we dwell in the death of the Lord Jesus right now, but we wait for resurrection. Winter is past. We wait for the erection of life. And you will see further on that this is a second sign that gives an opportunity to hear the sound in the night and the three dimensions and the spirit. This was the rain that is over and gone. You know, apart from uh, other uh, lands, the land of Israel was nourished by two kinds of rains. There were the early rains that were sent by God to sow, and then the latter rains that were also sent by God in order to, in order to nourish the fruit and this rain that was over in god also is a sign that the time for sowing and harvest has ended and now we need to fix our lamps and to go out and to meet the groom thus the rains that nourish our land is the preached word regarding the acceptance in the soil of our good heart the seed of the kingdom of heaven and growing the seed and the seizing of the rains testified that the time for sowing and for the growing of the fruit has ended and the time for harvest has come in which it was necessary to fulfill our to fix our lamps and to ready ourselves the face of our new man is highlighted as a burning lamp harvest 2027 20, the spirit of a man is the lamp of the lord searching or testing all the inner depths of his heart so this is the spiritual face of a person it is the lamb the essence of the sign is very interesting in what it is comprised of that the holy spirit is going to uncover through his messengers through those watchmen he has placed today he is going to uncover to the watchmen certain instructions and certain statutes how to go out and to meet the bridegroom how to please god how to walk in the light, how to walk into the sanctuary so that God can see the face of the innermost man so that God can lead a person out to glory. And in this manner, the rains that nourish the land is the preached word, again, about the acceptance in the soil of our good heart, the seed of the kingdom of heaven, and growing this seed. To receive the opportunity to understand and to hear in our heart this cry in the night, in this rain because again the rain was over and gone this is a sign we need to fulfill instructions that talk about the order in which a person can call upon the name of the lord do you understand that it turns out that the seizing of the rains testifies that we have the right to call on the name of the lord I didn't understand this right away. I only understood later that until the rain passes, the early and latter rain, a person does not have the right to call upon the name of the Lord. He has no right to come into the sanctuary. He has no right to be a priest and an intercessor. And when we had heard this sign, I say, you are going to see these signs in yourselves. You will see these right now and verify, test. Because in order to call on the name of the Lord, we need to be a spiritual man. We need to leave out of infancy. To leave out of infancy, meaning to die to all these institutes of authority that contend for leadership in our soul. So this order is comprised of us using the time of the early rains to sow the seed of the kingdom of heaven and the latter rains to use to growing this seed. And Joel chapter 2 verses 23 through 32, I will read selectively. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully. And he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. They will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord, remember whoever the Lord saves, whoever listens to the word, who accepts the word, and he who fulfills the word, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
for on Mount Zion only there and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. It turns out that this sign that the rain is over and gone, meaning this is to call on the Lord, which is our calling. Until this rain stops, the early and the latter rain, we can call upon the Lord. This is the great sign that we have heard. And I always thought that the rain had stopped. It talked about the teaching, the word, the preached word. I thought it's going to end. How is the rain going to end? And then all of a sudden it turns out that here we need to hear this sound in the night when we will understand that we have received the right to call on God, that we have the right to power to enter into this sanctuary, to be intercessors, to call upon God, can only be done by somebody who is uh, a priest, an intercessor. They're in that place where we can hear the voice of God. We can hear the voice of God. If I think you've understood this when our heart reacts to the Word of God, when we honor the Word, when, when we walk in the light, as Pastor said, in the light of the Word, because in the light of the Word can be only walked by a person who has fruit, and fruit can only be when there were early rains and latter rains. Early rains, again, are sent to sowing the seed, and the latter rains so that the fruit can grow fully. And when we have this fruit, then we have the right to call upon the name of the Lord. This is a sign, and it is yielded by the fact that we have the right to enter the sanctuary, that we are priests before God. The third sign, giving the opportunity to hear the voice in the night in the three dimensions of the Spirit, are the flowers that appear on the earth in our essence. This phrase in Hebrew means that the good soil of the human heart received the ability to see and understand how to come before the face of the Lord and to look at one another in order to be clothed in the perfection that is inherent to God. This also means to be ready to fulfill our initial calling. What is our initial calling? We all know and we hear about this that our initial calling was to practice the works of God, to practice justice. This image that Enoch had given birth to Methuselah, and then according to the birth of Methuselah, he walked 300 years in order to fulfill this justice. Therefore, let's look at what it means in Hebrew that the flowers appeared on the earth. Now we need to see this sign in ourselves, and this is very important. And this means to see, to look at, to ponder over, to understand, to be, to be shown, to look at one another, to be ready to fulfill the decree. The meaning of the sign in the heart of a person in which the flowers appeared on the earth tells us that the promises of God grown in the Eden of the heart begin to be realized thanks to the fact that a person has become an organized partaker of the body of Christ in the image of the bee family. So this tells us that a person has united with Zion, has united with the truth here. Because flowers we can see in our heart only when we have the correct relations with the saints in the church. When we are united, the bee family, they are very friendly. They have these flowers where they're going to gather. These relations we can see only in Zion, these correct relations. And in this dignity, a person has received the opportunity to gather nectar from these flowers and to form them into honey. You see where the flowers are? We need to see them because today uh, not all see these revelations which all of a sudden appear in our heart, but we begin to see them. And we begin to gather honey, revelations. Pastor, on, two, on Sunday he said, when Jesus had turned, he turned to who? He turned to those who Jews who had believed and he highlighted to those that had affirmed. Those that had affirmed are those that began to see this change in themselves thanks to those truths and revelations which we receive in our heart. 
we begin to see certain changes in our character, in our walk, how we behave, what we say. Furthermore, for the revelations of God in these flowers, which were sh shown in the soil of our heart, for us to hear the sound in the night, the call in the night, we need to ponder upon these revelations and to interpret them into the ready product of honey through our reasoning. This pastor had said back in 2016, I looked back and I said, oh, I only just now uh, understood the truth. And then I looked back and it was written also in the book, The Light of the Morning Star, uh, which was way longer ago. It turns out that to ponder upon and to reason, we today have understood this well because we ponder over that which we don't understand. I always had protested. I thought, how do I ponder over that which I don't understand? I said, I ponder over that which I understand, but this is like this resistance, this infancy, this carnal nature. But it turns out that the wise virgins, it's written that when they had taken the oil and their lamps and when they had taken uh, the oil of the vessels and went out to the lamps they had oil in their vessels pondering they had breads on the golden table which they didn't understand till the very end so there are things that we won't understand until the very end even when we go out to meet the bridegroom this doesn't tell us that we aren't going to understand at all every sabbath the priests had taken these breads off the table and placed new ones Today we understand a lot, even this truth, to uh, ponder upon and to reason over. We need to ponder over them and create them into new honey in, in our reasoning. And so to ponder upon this ready product of honey, we need the book of the law to not depart from our lips day and night. And you'll ask, how is this possible? I ask myself this question, and the answer I again saw here. Here we have... Uh, astonishing stunning truths ezekiel chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 moreover he said to me son of man eat what you find eat the scroll and go speak to the house of israel so i opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll and he said to me son of man feed your belly and fill your stomach with the scroll that i give you so i ate and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness And so to hear and to understand in our heart the sound in the night and the fragrant flowers in our heart, it is necessary to be clothed in the dignity of a disciple. Can you imagine the dignity of the noble status of a disciple allows us to ponder over these truths and to reason over these truths. And God views this as the fact that the law, the book of the law will not depart from our lips day and night when we have pondering and reasoning over. Pondering and reasoning over can only be in disciples. As soon as we lose the status, the status of a disciple, we can't ponder. Who is going to give to us? We won't be able to receive because we're not disciples. Therefore, the status of a disciple is very high and lofty, the unearthly status and noble status of a disciple. Because the book that contains in itself all the revelations of God can be eaten by us or understood by our heart only through instruction and faith. Therefore, we need today to understand all of these truths with our heart through instruction and faith, through pondering over those truths that we don't understand so that we can ponder uh, over that which we don't understand. There is a price, there is time. We need to be immersed in the Word. We need to listen. We need to come to all services. We need to be obedient behave correctly because pondering is involves the great price otherwise how will we ponder there's a great price upon pondering and when god gives us the right to understand some kind of truth and to rejoice and to thank god for it to reason over it and to proclaim it the fourth sign that gives us the opportunity to hear the voice in the night in the three dimensions of the spirit is the time of singing that has come the phrase the time of singing has come in Hebrew means that the good soul of our heart received the opportunity to lift up our, above our enemies. 
And this, again, is to be ready to go out to Mount Carmel. For example, there are going to be the worshippers of Baal and going up onto Mount Carmel. Over these that resist the truth, we will be lifted up over them. Psalms chapter 27, verses 4 through 6. David writes, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. The time for singing has come. This means that the time to trample on the enemies has come, or rather to overcome the enemies. We sing Psalms 29 out. Every day we sing this, uh, many times during the day, and each time saints testify. When I begin to ponder upon this Psalm 29, there are so many truths that are uncovered in this Psalm. There are so many new truths, and they become my strength in my life. Let's read it. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. We have lifted up on Mount, been lifted up on Mount Carmel so that we are delivered from our enemies. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of His and give thanks at the remembrance of His holy name. You have lifted me up and delivered me so that I do not go into the pit. This is that which we sing every day, our daily song. This means that we have heard this sign that the time of singing has come. This means that the time to trample or rather to overcome the enemies in our essence has come this psalm the fifth sign giving us the opportunity to hear the cry in the night in our heart and to come out to see the bridegroom or to meet the bridegroom is the ab uh, ability to hear the voice of the turtle dove in our land in order to understand and to hear in our heart the voice in the night in the image of the turtle dove our heart needs to have the dignity of a turtle dove or rather to meet or coincided with the nature of a turtle dove. In all places of scripture, a turtle dove represents the image of the Holy Spirit. And a dove represents the image of the chosen remnant of dove, chosen remnant of God in the image of the bride of the Lamb. Because the bride of the Lamb as the Holy Spirit has the same nature, the same nature, which is expressed first how? It is expressed in in the lack of protection that that the Holy Spirit has. This is the lack of protection, defenselessness. Holy Spirit is, or rather, God is protected, Jesus is protected, Holy Spirit is unprotected. Therefore, in this case, what is also significant is that in the original of Hebrew, under the image of dove and turtle dove, we see uh, a wild dove, and for thus there is there is a, a meaning a meaning here. Turtle dove. That's why here it talks about how to hear to hear the sound of the turtle dove in our land. For God, the dignity of a turtle dove in the heart of a person is expressed in a uh, watchtower, the property of which allows a person to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in his heart and the Holy Spirit the opportunity to hear our voice. So to hear the voice in our land, in our essence, in our heart, in our thoughts. Again, let's read this place of scripture. Habakkuk, uh, the pro this prophet, had this. He had this turtle dove, this ability he had. He had the state of this wild turtle dove, not just an ordinary t dove, but a turtle dove. He had built himself in such a watchtower. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it will speak and it will not lie. 
Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. And so, to understand and to hear in our heart the cry in the night in the voice of the turtle dove, it is necessary to grow and to show in our faith the seven properties of the fruit of our spirit. These are not earthly properties. We know, show in your faith virtue and virtue knowledge and knowledge self-control and self-control patience and patience, godliness and godliness, brotherly love and brotherly love, love. These are unearthly qualities of the Holy Spirit which will give us the opportunity to hear, to hear on this watchtower and to speak with the Holy Spirit. And this is what this is referring to here, that we will have the opportunity to hear the voice of the turtle dove in our land, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, to hear His voice. A person himself won't be able to grow on his own, to build himself in such a way. The Holy Spirit can do this. The sixth sign um, this is this sign that has brought me to awe. I think you will also see this as well. We listened to uh, this sermon and this Sunday. Sixth, the ability to hear the sound in the night in our heart is comprised in the fig tree that puts forth her green figs. The phrase, the fig tree puts forth her green figs, on one hand means to embalm our soul buried in the death of Christ in baptism in water, Holy Spirit in fire, and on the other hand to fill with the juice of life, that fruit of resurrection, to make it uh, mature or to bring it to a ripened state. So in the death of the Lord Jesus, our soul is going to be embalmed and will be able to come to the resurrection of life. How can we see in ourselves that our fig tree has put forth her green figs? Or how do we, do we embalm our soul? The answer was on Sunday. It is necessary to accept the truth about our co-crucifixion with Christ. When we accept into our heart this truth about crucifixion with Christ, we, and you heard this truth, we stop belonging to ourselves. We no longer belong to ourselves because we in this time die to the things of this world, to the nation and the subject of our nationality, to the house of our Father, and to all of our corrupt desires. And in this moment, we then in Christ Jesus become the property of God, the organized partaker of the body of Christ. And in this manner, uh, this what I, I placed this passage, took it and placed it here because we heard it on Sunday. Pay attention that here is contained a depth, which I also didn't see, but I saw when I heard it here. I was so astonished when I saw this. I will read it and we will look at it. The acceptance of such a fragrant truth about crucifixion with Christ. Again, we're talking about crucifixion with Christ. The acceptance of such a fragrant truth comprised in the truth of the cross of Christ prepares our body for burial in Christ Jesus and is viewed by Scripture or by God as preparing in our body the body of the Lord Jesus to burial. Can you imagine? I didn't see this when I listened when Pastor had said I listened uh, even before I had such a privilege, I heard it, but I didn't pay attention. And then when all of a sudden he began to speak this, I didn't understand. I said, wait, when we die, he explained, when we die to the things of this world, in the face of our nation, the house of our Father, to all of our corrupt desires, at this time we prepare our body for burial, our body. We embalm our souls, and this is necessary for us. Our soul has a need of this oil when we die. It needs to be embalmed because it is dying. And she needs a certain oil and she needs this aroma. We are talking about the sign. The fig tree brings forth its green bud. And now, how does God view this? And Pastor said, God views this, uh, this as preparing, in fact,
the body of Christ for burial. I always asked question, how do we prepare Christ for burial? Because this was what Mary had done, what Joseph had done. They had done something. But this answer to me was as like a strong revelation that was given. Matthew chapter 26, verses 12 through 13. Allow me to read it. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. So again, when we die to the things of this world, Pastor explained it very well. I listen, listen. I thought, how is this so? When we die to the things of this world, to our nation, to the house of our Father, when we die in this time, we prepare our body for burial. So in fact, we embalm our soul. Our soul has a need in this embalming. But God views in this time that we are preparing the body of Christ for burial. His Son, He views it in such a way. But for what goal? You'll ask, well, what for what goal? So we can resurrect with Him. If we don't do this, we won't resurrect and rise with Him. That's why the fig let forth its green buds. This is the sign that we ought to see in ourselves. Apostle Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We are talking about, again, how to embalm our soul, or how do we see this sign that the green, that the fig tree gave forth her green figs. To give green f uh, figs is to embalm. Embalm means to, to die, to die to all that is old, to our uh, old beginning to fill with the juice of life the fruit of spirit. How do we do this? When we look at the invisible, when we call the inexistent power of death in our life as already existent, when we don't look behind, we make the fruit mature by the power of resurrection. We bring this fruit to a ripened state in the power of eternal life. This is our soul that has a need of this. When we do this, God does this, and He looks at this moment as the prepare, uh, preparing of Christ's body for burial. And to understand the voice in the night in the fig tree that brings, puts forth its green buds, it's necessary for our heart to also belong to the heritage of the fig tree or to be a fig tree that brings its fruit in time, meaning to be this fig tree. Because a fig tree that does not offer its fruit, what will happen? God will uh, uproot it. It is subjected to curse. That's why it must offer fruit. This is the kind of love that God demonstrates. Sometimes a person says, God loves everyone. This is foolish to say this. God loves only those who offer fruit. A fig tree represents the people of Israel that have come from Abraham and Sarah. The Sweet fruits of the fig tree represent the grace of God grown in the heart of a person so that grace can reign. Grace reigns through righteousness, through the fruit of righteousness. The lack of sweet fruit on our fig tree is a result that a person, instead of looking upon the perfection of God in the death of the Lord Jesus, looked upon material blessings which he hoped to receive through the exercise of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. As we heard, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they always, uh, they can become an idol. It's necessary for us to always place the 
a gifter above the gifts. The anointer over the anointing. And because a person does not submit to the command of God to look at the invisible, we had just read about what it means to spring for or to bring forth its buds. It's to fill with the with the juice of life, the fruit of the spirit, to call the inexistent as existent. And because a person has not submitted to the command of God to look at the invisible, the ear of his heart was incapable of hearing the cry in the night in the sweet fruits. And I want to end this component because just as Pastor ended it, that we are ready to pay any measure of the price that the Holy Spirit offers us in order to receive our sworn inheritance together with God, because we have been crucified with God, with Christ, and we with the law died to the law in the face of our nation, the house of our Father, and all corrupt desires, that as a result we can be we can be filled with this juice of, of life, this fig tree. There is a seventh sign. I can just very quickly uh, tell it because these are with, um, with large commentaries. These are the vines with the tender grapes that give a good smell. I know that you will listen. Pastor has explained it very well. And you can listen to it. I don't have the right to hold you back. Hold your time. I just want to say that these truths, they truly today are such depth. It is impossible to listen to them once we want to listen to them because in them are contained always some kind of treasure. Something is present and as soon as you look into it, you see. Therefore, we right now will bow our heads and will pray and thank God that we have such a privilege to hear his word. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for this ability and privilege that we have today in Christ Jesus being found upon this place that has been blessed in your presence where your fear is present to incline our head and heart to thank you for that word with which you fill our heart to thank you for that might and for that greatness which today is magnified in our hearts because we have magnified your word above all name in our body. We have bowed down before this word, and we thank you that you have made us and gave us the high status of servant. You showed us the house of God, your sanctuary. You had shown us an uncovered Zion. You had shown us what are the narrow gates, and we have entered into these narrow gates having this great privilege and we have worshipped here before your face because you have uncovered your full beautiful order your order which is built up in a sanctuary in our body and in heaven and looking at this order you begin to build each of us into perfection you want for each of us to leave infancy so that we can leave this infancy and be led to perfection. And today you give this opportunity when you uncover such truths, such revelations, which begin to change us, to change our thinking, to change our heart, to change our walk before your countenance. When we become in the likeness of you, when we are illuminated in the image of perfection that is inherent to you, because this is our initial calling to fulfill this justice and you gave us this right and this ability and we today can be found to hear all of these signs which you today have shown us you today show us such depths 
and purposes of each sign, each truth, which all of a sudden have began to be uncovered in our heart. We hear this and we thank you. We have fixed our lamps, lamps and the vessels that are in us, that pondering over that which we think about, those truths, which possibly today don't fully have become understood by us, but we will ponder over them, we will be immersed so that we can understand everything completely, so that we can form ourselves into the perfection that is inherent to our Heavenly Father. We thank you for this place. We thank you that we continue to hear your voice. We continue to hear your revelations. We thank you that you have given such great mercy in the face of our messenger. We thank you, Lord. We thank you and bow our heads for that pre over that preached word, or rather bow our heads and thanks for that preached word that we hear from this place that ends up in our heart in the dignity of those thoughts that come from you and we can glorify the remembrance in our in our lives may our fellowship be blessed upon this place our almighty god father son and holy spirit amen our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen we will conclude with our unchanging manifestation now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory and unblemished joy to god our savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever amen <laughs>